Well, would you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. While you're turning there, let me tell you how humbling it is for me, like Kevin DeYoung earlier, to be at this platform. In 1995, I was a young 20-something minister of the gospel in my first church, and I was defeated and discouraged. I saw things I never thought I would see. I heard things I never thought I would hear. I had to deal with issues I never expected to deal with. And I was pouty and whiny and self-pitying. And I was at the point of just walking away from ministry in the church. And my wife Maria and I took a weekend trip to Memphis for a conference where John Piper was speaking. And honestly, at that point, I was so spiritually empty that it was an excuse for us just to get away uh, from our setting for a couple of days. And while we were there, I kept thinking through what's an, what's an exit strategy for me to get away from all this carnality and all of this stuff that I'm having to deal with. And John Piper preached on providence and the cross. And in the middle of that message, with tears streaming down my face, I turned to my wife and said, we can do this by God's power and by God's grace. And that message that day the Lord used to pierce through something weak and something sinful in my own heart, and I would not be in ministry if it were not for that. Maybe some of you in here who are defeated and discouraged, and some of you are growing cynical about the church, And if so, I pray that this conference has a similar effect by the Spirit on your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'd like for us to begin reading with verse 14 and read an extended passage of Scripture. Not going to have a detailed exposition of this passage. There is so much that could be said. One could preach for weeks and weeks and months on this long section of Scripture that we're about to read. Beginning with 1 Corinthians chapter 4, knowing that these words were breathed out by the Spirit of Christ, the apostles say, so they come to us this evening with the exact same authority as if our Lord Jesus were standing here speaking these words with his mouth physically. Let's stand in reverence for the word of Christ. Apostle Paul writes as he is carried along by the Holy Spirit to the church at Corinth. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. So what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and of evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, because then you would need to go out of the world. 
But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil man from among you. And when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to the law court before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Holy Father, we ask right now that you would silence any spirit in this place that exalts itself above or beside the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Father, we pray that your word would go forward, that your word would cut through any opposition in our affections, in our wills, in our minds to the gospel that you have given to us, to the faith that you have handed down to us. And Father, we pray that by our time together, looking at your word with one another, that you would equip us to encourage one another and to build up one another for the sake of the advance of your church. And we ask this to the glory of the name of Jesus and in his name alone. Amen. You may be seated. If you get on a subway in Manhattan, you'll see signs all over the place that read, if you see something, say something. These signs are part of a public relations campaign meant to encourage people to be on the watch out for potential terrorists. So if anything unusual is going on, you're supposed to alert the authorities and let them know, I, I see something that I think is suspect. I, I observe something that just doesn't seem right to me. It just doesn't seem normal. And in this way, the city of New York will be better equipped, the theory goes, to deal with potential terrorists. Problem is, the campaign has been a colossal failure. No terrorists have been arrested as a result of this campaign. And in last week's New York Magazine, there were several reasons given for that. And one of them given by the authorities responsible is, you know, we tell people if you see something weird, let us know, but there's just too much weird stuff going on in New York City. I mean, what are you supposed to report when you're on a subway where there may be someone who has wires coming out of his coat and it's an art project somewhere? You see someone who seems inebriated or somebody who seems to be on drugs, who's inebriated and on drugs? You see people who are seem suspicious and seem out of place and they're part of some bizarre and eclectic cult that has just come to the city. No one can call in and say, I see something that doesn't look normal if you don't know what normal is supposed to look like. That's not only true on the subway in New York City. 
part of the obstacle that you and I face when it comes to holiness, when it comes to being sanctified, is that we don't know what normal looks like. We live in a fallen universe. We have grown up in a fallen universe. We live, as Isaiah tells us, among a people of unclean lips, even as we are a people of unclean lips. And in the middle of all of that, what can seem to be normal to me can simply be my own pattern of sin. What seems to be regular and the default simply can be the fact that I am living around people who have similar sorts of slaveries and bondages to sin and to Satan and to the curse and to death. And what the gospel of Jesus Christ does is to break through this bizarre, unusual, unnatural kind of life that we are living with a new normal that Jesus defines as the kingdom of God. And this kingdom, Jesus says to his apostles, isn't just some generic category and it isn't just something that waits for us in the next thousand or million or billion or trillion years. This kingdom, Jesus says, shows up in the assemblies. At Caesarea Philippi, Jesus speaks of the coming of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom. And he says, this kingdom is going to advance, this kingdom is going to be invincible, the gates of hell will not stand against it, the powers of Satan will not overcome it. And he says, this kingdom is going to be seen in the reality that I will build my church. I will assemble my people together. There is no kingdom, the Bible tells us, where there is not a people. There is no reign where there is not an empire of those to be reigned over. And Jesus says, in the middle of this fallen world, you will see what the Apostle Paul says to the church at Ephesus is a sign of the manifold wisdom of God, a sign to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places where God has appointed Jesus to reign and to rule over his church as a head with a body, as a king over a kingdom. And while the whole world, the scripture says, lies under the sway of the wicked one, while there is a God of this age, a prince of the power of this air, in these local assemblies and in these gatherings, we see a sign of the reign of Christ. That's why Paul's letter here to the church at Corinth is so significant. He is talking to a group of people who are living out the beginning stages of the reality that Jesus promised at Caesarea Philippi. The building and the gathering of this church, of this kingdom colony, and what is happening here is of absolute significance to our sanctification. Our problem typically is that we think of sanctification as primarily an individual thing. How often do I read my Bible? How often do I pray? How often do I meditate on the things of God? How often do I sing and give praise to God? And all of those things are significant and all of those things are important. But we too often neglect that all of that is only true because we are part of the body of Christ. We are part of his church. And the theme of this meeting is so critically important, act the miracle, God's work and our work. Not just my work, not just your work, but our work in the sanctification process. I want you to notice several things about what Paul is pointing out here to this church at Corinth. The first 
is the, the role of proclamation in the corporate nature of sanctification. Paul writes to this church at Corinth, a church that is troubled and a church that has people within it who are talking, he says, arrogantly. They are acting as though they are already kings. And he says, I have demonstrated who I am. I have demonstrated the apostleship that I carry. I have demonstrated the commission that I have from the Lord Jesus Christ. I have sent to you, Timothy. I have sent to you the word of the gospel. I have shown you my life. I've, I've, I've given you every reason and every way to imitate it. He says, but there are those who are still speaking with arrogance. There are those who are still opposing this kind of apostolic authority. And he says... I want to see what they've got. I'm going to be coming to you very soon and we will see these people who are talking if what they have is just talk. Because the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. The kingdom of God is a matter of power. Now, you look at that and it it sounds at first blush as though Paul is threatening some kind of physical encounter. We're going to see whether or not you have talk or whether you have power. As though the Apostle Paul is going to show up and say, okay, you've got your arrogant talk, deal with my heat ray vision. Deal with my levitating power to swoop you up off your chairs and send you out into the streets. But no, 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 no. Paul says, I'm going to come to you and come to you with what? With words, with talk, with a spirit of gentleness or with a spirit of discipline. But he is still dealing in Words. The contrast is not between words and a lack of words. It's between empty, idle, meaningless talk and authority. I will come to you with power. And what is the power? The power is the proclamation that is coming, bearing the authority and the spirit and the presence of Christ. He says, when you're gathered together in Jesus' name, in Jesus' power, and my spirit is there with you, as you are reading this letter, There is a power that comes with these words, the kind of power that you see at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus turns to his disciples in Matthew 16 and says, who do people say that I am? That's a very low threshold kind of question, a very non-threatening sort of question. You just deal with the poll data there. Well, some people say John the Baptist, and some people say Elijah. These are just words. They're they're going out there, and they're not doing anything. They're not affecting anything. But Jesus turns when Simon Peter, by the Spirit, confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus turns to this man, Simon the fisherman, and names him. Now, that is authority. I get people's names wrong a lot, call them by the wrong name sometimes when I forget. Sometimes even my own children have to be reminded which one's which in the middle of a hectic encounter in a grocery store. But I've never named anybody. You look like a Bob to me. There's a kind of audacity that comes with Jesus standing and speaking, you are Peter, you are rock. And what's even more audacious is that it doesn't seem to be true. (laughs) It's not true at all. This is the least rock-like person that you can find. Just a few verses down, Jesus is going to name him again, Satan. He's going to be the one that when Jesus is arrested, leaves. And in the middle of it, he says all kinds of stupid things at inappropriate times. 
but Jesus names him rock, foundation stone of my church. And then what does Jesus by his spirit and by his word do? He makes him live up to his name. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. The voice of Jesus sent out and working in the life of Peter takes a name that seems as ridiculous as naming an elderly barren man, father of many nations, but he makes the name true by the power of his transforming word. Paul assumes that the apostolic authority that he carries, that the proclamation of this spirit-inspired word brings with it the authority of Jesus himself. And I don't know about you, but maybe you have relatives who have a lot of opinions about world events. Maybe you have some of the extended family that I have that sit in front of a big screen Fox News or a big screen MSNBC and they, they see what's going on in the world and a lot of times they have really good insight on what's going on. But every once in a while, I'll run into a really elderly great aunt in my family and she'll have crazy opinions based upon some conspiracy theory that she's seen on television. And she'll say, you know, what I think we need to do is just bomb Iran and Syria and Canada. We don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> I don't argue with her. Sit and listen to Aunt Flossie talk about world events. It doesn't matter. Aunt Flossie could even go, one would suppose, to the United Nations and stand outside and with a bullhorn yell, we ought to bomb Iran and Syria and Canada. And people would just say, ah, oh, there's a crazy old lady out there, let's go on in. But imagine if Aunt Flossie is the United States ambassador to the United Nations. Now when she stands up and says, hey, you know what I'm thinking? It creates all kinds of mayhem people start suddenly becoming very uncomfortable and they're debating the issue. And why? Because she is not speaking on her own behalf. She is coming with the authority of a power that is able to actually carry out what she's threatening. Paul says that is what is happening with the authority of the preached word. When you and I gather together and hear the word of God as it is rightly preached, we are hearing an ambassadorial plea that has been sent down from our Lord Jesus himself so that, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are speaking, pleading with you as though Christ himself were pleading through us, be reconciled to God. When you are rightly proclaiming the word of God, there ought to be a Northern Galilean accent in there. People ought to hear a familiar voice that ver first called them out of darkness. And whenever Jesus begins speaking, everywhere that we see Jesus speak, things start happening. Demons start shrieking. They see that their power is being broken. That is what is happening when we gather together and hear the word preached. That's what happens when we admonish one another and teach one another. That's what's happening when we sing and teach one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's not just information that is being downloaded. That's expository exorcism. The power of Jesus' voice 
residing in his church under the authority of the Word of God and reflecting upon the authority of the Word of God breaks through those patterns of deception that keep us from seeing the glory of the light of God reflected in the face of Jesus Christ. It's not just an information download. It's not just principles for living. When we teach one another and when we preach to one another and when we sing to one another and when we rebuke one another and when we admonish one another and when we do so not on the basis of our own authority but on the basis of the Word of God, there is a power, power packed, wonder working power in that proclamation that creates and forms exactly what Jesus says. This is why the Bible is written to the whole church. The Bible isn't written in bits and pieces for people in particular life situations. Sometimes that single woman who has never been married and never will be married, doesn't sense any calling to be married, can come to our congregation and say, eh, I don't really feel comfortable here. Why do I need to be in a sermon on marriage? Because Ephesians chapter 5 isn't just written to the married couples at the church at Ephesus. It's written to the church at Ephesus and to the whole church because you single woman in this congregation are accountable not only for your own life and your own sanctification, but to teach and to admonish and to hold accountable those marriages within the church. Why do I need a sermon series on parenting when I'm an 88-year-old man with no children, I've, I've been widowed for years, there's no prospect of any children out there. Because you are to hold accountable and to teach and to encourage and to rebuke the whole church when it comes to parenting. You are a kingdom of priests under the proclamation of the Word of God that creates and brings about sanctification and holiness. But notice also, it's not just proclamation, it's also discipline. Paul immediately, after he talks about this power in contrast to the talk about his coming behind his words, starts talking about a situation of scandal. He says, there is a man in your midst who is unrepentantly sinning against God, and the problem is that you're doing nothing. He begins to speak to them about that kingdom authority and that kingdom responsibility for discipline. Exactly what Jesus said when he said at Caesarea Philippi, I am giving to you the keys of the kingdom. Now, one of the things that irritates me when it comes to the way we talk, and I say we, I mean me as well as anybody else, is it typically when we say church discipline, he's under church discipline, we mean excommunication. Someone who is under church discipline is someone who has been voted out of the fellowship of the church. We are all under church discipline. Discipline is not simply excommunication. As a matter of fact, excommunication is actually the end of church discipline. I have now been handed over to Satan. Discipline is not just in Scripture that final phase of a lack of repentance. Discipline is every step along the way, starting with the definition of who's who. He says, there is sexual immorality among you. Who's you? The church of God at Corinth called out and sanctified by the Spirit and by the blood of Christ. It is the authority that Jesus has given to his church, dependent and derivative upon his word, to mark out and to identify 
who are those who are qualified to be called brother and called sister based upon the criteria of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. When the church baptizes and marks out its boundaries, when the church receives into its membership, into its structure of accountability, that church is defining the boundaries of discipline. This is not the world out there in the chaotic anarchy that is the rule of Satan. This is the church. This is where Jesus right now is actively ruling and we, on the basis of what Jesus has said to us, declare, you are my brother. You are my sister. You have been received by Christ. Now, I don't have personal authority to define that. And we don't have individual congregational authority to define that. The king of the kingdom has defined who are those who are received by God. We, when we speak rightly and when we speak on the basis of what Jesus has given us, we are declaring in the voice of Jesus, you are one of the brothers. You are one of the sisters. That is a powerful, powerful responsibility. This time of year in election year, Christians can become so weird. They get so panicky. They get so fretful. They get so angry. They go on Facebook and have all kinds of conspiracy theories about whatever candidate they don't support and they, they have all sorts of debates with people that they don't agree with and, and they become so fretful as an election approaches and it always is every four years and you can mark this down no matter what. I can tell you four years from now in 2016, the Christian community will say, this is the most important election that has happened in our lifetimes. No doubt. Every four years we say that. And th that is important. Those things are significant. But your vote on receiving a new member into your congregation is more significant in the long term than your vote for who will be the next president of the United States. When the congregation says we receive you as brother. And when the congregation refuses to deal with an issue that would seem to show a lack of repentance, that congregation is speaking for Jesus in a place that congregation has no authority and no mandate to speak. You see these empty suit, toothy, preachers on CNN who get on talking about this very light and fluffy gospel, who start to become very nervous when the host says, well, what about Muslims and what about Hindus and what about atheists? Do they go to hell? You, you see that guy, the, the, the grin starts to get frozen. He starts to get really uncomfortable. Well, for me, I think Jesus is the best way. And there's just a sense of reluctance to say what the scripture has said so clearly about the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's easy for us to look at that and say that's pathetic, and yet that's what many of us do. We have people in our congregations that we are saying by the fact that we list them as brother and sister and we treat them as brother and sister without a life of faith and of gathering together and of repenting of sin, we are saying, Jesus says, you are our brother. When you have no warrant to say that, you might as well go door to door simply saying to everyone who opens the door, I'll see you in heaven. The membership of the church and the accountability of the church is the discipline of the church. Now, you only have the authority, again, to discipline where Jesus has given that authority. 
in his word. We don't discipline one another and excommunicate one another because we disagree over homeschooling or public schooling. We don't excommunicate one another and discipline one another because we differ on whether or not you ought to celebrate Halloween. But where the scripture says this is a lack of repentance and a lack of obedience, and Jesus says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, what Paul says happens is not just when that unrepentant person going through all the process of be reconciled, repent, be reconciled, repent. When that person refuses to repent and the church hands that person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that is not just clearing out a membership role. That is not punishing that person and saying, we don't want your kind around here. That is the voice of Jesus saying, I am turning you over to the power of Satan. If he turns, Jesus says, you have received your brother. Why? My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Only difference between Peter weeping in the arms of Jesus and Judas tangled up in his own intestines in a potter's field is the kind of repentance the voice of Jesus brings. The discipline of the congregation spurs us to holiness not only because we deal with lack of repentance and lack of faith among us, but also because this discipline and this accountability changes us. Notice what Paul says, you ought to be mourning you ought to be crying. You are arrogant that you don't even notice this. And why don't you notice this? Because you don't know where you are. He says, I don't want you to be with the swindlers and the sexually immoral people, and I'm not talking about those out in the world. I'm not trying to have some kind of a premature rapture here. He says, I am talking about those within the accountability of the church. We tend to get that completely reversed. Let's express our outrage with everything that's going on out there. And we ignore what is happening among us. The discipline and the accountability of the church changes your affections. It changes your mission. It changes the way that you see people. And it drives you toward holiness and it drives you toward love. Why? Because the presence of Jesus is in your midst by his word and by his spirit. But notice, it's not only proclamation and discipline Paul also turns and starts talking about the economy of the church, the, the structure and the life that is being lived within the church. He says, your problem is not only that you're tolerating this kind of behavior, the problem is also that you're fighting with one another and you're struggling with one another and you're doing it by taking one another to court. He says, this ought to shame you. You ought to be embarrassed about this. These bickerings and these divisions that are between you. It ought to embarrass you. It ought to shame you. And even more so that you're taking it to those who have no standing in the church. Why? Because the gifts that Jesus is giving to the body are not simply or not at all, means of personal self-actualization. They are given for the building up of the body and they are a sign of spiritual warfare. That Jesus has taken captivity captive. When a soldier stands in Saddam Hussein's bathtub and sends pictures back home, standing there in this palace of a dictator. He is celebrating the fact that the dictator is gone and his army has won. When Jesus gifts his church, he is prepping his church, he is staffing up his church for a future kingdom that is to come. We have all these spiritual gifts inventories 
We spend so much time worried about what's my spiritual gift and let me look at all of the, I'm not saying those things aren't of some value, but the main issue is not whether or not you know what your spiritual gift is. It's whether or not in the life of the church, your spiritual gift is operative and functioning and building up the body of Christ. It's not your gift, it belongs to the body. Paul says, is there no, is there nobody wise enough among you to decide these disputes? What's the problem? The problem is, Paul says, when you go to the outside, which doesn't have to be in a formal law court, you can do that in the court of public opinion on the internet. When you go to those who have no standing within the church, he says, you are already defeated. Why? Don't you know that you will judge angels? Don't you know that you will rule the world? Jesus gifts his church because he is showing you in little things. He is training you in little areas of authority to rule over many things, to rule and to reign with me, he says. Your life within the body of the church is just an internship for the eschaton. Why are these people bickering and fighting with one another? Why do they think that their agendas matter so much? It's because they are not looking to their next trillion years. They think this and this only is where I am going to be able to carry out my little place of power and my little place of authority, and so I don't care about anything beyond that. Some of you may have kindergartners, they may have an election for kindergarten president. And if your son or daughter wins the kindergarten presidency, congratulations. Decorate a cake. Take pictures. But you know what? If you're 40 years old and you are still glorying in the fact that you were the president of Mrs. Tinsley's kindergarten class, you are a loser. And if you are 40 years old and you are still bitter, I think that thing was rigged. <laughs> I should have been the president of Mrs. Tinsley's kindergarten class. You are a loser. Your life should have moved on. Paul says you are going to judge angels. You are going to rule over the entire universe. And when you come together and you argue and you bicker and then you go out to the pagan world and say we need you to help us to discern good from evil, right from wrong, you are declaring the incompetence of Jesus to rule over his kingdom within his church. Paul says, you have the mind of Christ. You have everything that is necessary for godliness. And within this congregation, part of the way that Jesus sanctifies you is by putting you together with people where you are exercising wisdom and you are exercising gifts and you are being trained in some way for a greater and more majestic responsibility later on. So who cares right now if somebody has defrauded you? Why not rather be defrauded for the sake of the mission that you have waiting for you? You're sanctified as you are giving and as you are serving for the upbuilding of the body because you see the big picture of what's happening. I have the worship tastes of a 75-year-old woman. <laughs> because I grew up in a church where the worship music was chosen by 75-year-old women. <laughs> and so when I hear Fanny Crosby, and when I hear Victory in Jesus, and when I hear brethren we have met to worship with a fiddle, it wasn't a violin in that moment, that was a fiddle, it was great. I come alive with that because it, it reaches something primal in me that was formed long, long, long ago. 
often the kinds of squabbles and bickerings that we have over worship and particularly over music have everything to do with what the apostle is talking about here. I assume that the issue is my personal sanctification in the now. What does it take to speak to me so that I can close my eyes and pretend like it's just me and Jesus in the congregation and have a foretaste of heaven? Problem is, that's not a foretaste of heaven. It's not just you and Jesus. It turns out you don't come to the garden alone, which is a disappointment for me. You are teaching one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You are doing warfare with one another against the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And you are preparing yourselves through the worship of God's people for a new era and a new creation. You are giving yourself over to the sanctification of someone else. I don't worry that we have worship wars. I just worry that we have the wrong kinds of worship wars. I wish that somebody could show me a congregation that is at loggerheads with one another because the 75-year-old women are saying, you know, there's just too much how great thou art in here. We really, we have a lot of young people who are new to the Christian faith. We need some Lecrae. I've looked it up on the internet. Here's Lecrae. Or a congregation where that 22-year-old single guy is coming in and saying, wait, these drums are too loud. This music is too unfamiliar. We have some 75-year-old women back here that we need to speak to and we need to teach and we need to instruct with some hymns that they know. That's the kind of worship war we ought to see. Counting one another is more important than yourself and outdoing one another and showing honor to one another. Why? Because you in this place and in this service and in this moment are being shaped and prepared for something that is far deeper and wider than your hymn set or your praise chorus arrangement. He says, you are being prepared to rule. And then notice finally, there's the corporate aspect of testimony. He says, don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Columnist David Brooks says that we live in an arena culture. The things that tend to give people meaning are politics and sports. I identify with my political party and my political candidates, and if you say anything about my political party or about my political candidates, you're talking about me. Or I identify myself with my team, and I can be in an arena full of people cheering for my team and my life now transcends the little meaning that it has and I'm part of something big. I'm part of this big movement that's there and it, it gives me a sense of meaning. The arena culture that God has called us to in our sanctification is an arena that is much bigger than a sports stadium or a political convention. He says, remember who you are. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The power of Christ together breaks through the deception of the satanic powers. The ways it's easy for me to identify your sin, but in my case, there are always reasons. I don't see it. I am guarded against it. Do you not know that the unrighteous, and he lists out what that means, the swindlers, the adulterers, the fornicators, the homosexuals, the thieves, will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
He breaks the deception that is said from the very beginning, you will not surely die. But that's not the only power that the word given to the church breaks. Breaks that other power of Satan, which is accusation. Not only don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, but he makes the division here not between the swindlers, the idolaters, the sexually immoral, and the regular people. No, 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 no. It's between the swindlers, the idolaters, the fornicators, the homosexuals, and the swindlers, the fornicators, the adulterers, the homosexuals who have been crucified. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed, you were forgiven. Being together in the fellowship of the church and learning to bear with one another's sins and repentances and grievances and weak points points me to the reality of my own standing before God, not as some neutral, normal person, but as a sinner who deserves to hear only, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Such were some of you, but the blood of Jesus cleanses. When a congregation receives that man who says, I broke up my family and I abandoned my children and I am haunted every day by their screams when I walked out that door and speaks to that repentant soul with the words of Jesus based upon the gospel your sins have been forgiven you. We are speaking also back to ourselves in whatever we were hiding behind, even if it was some self-righteous form of religion. The same blood that cleanses the swindler cleanses the idolater. And the same blood that cleanses the idolater cleanses the fornicator. And the same blood that cleanses the fornicator cleanses the thief. And the same blood that cleanses the thief cleanses the self-righteous legalist. And it goes on and on and on and on. Why? Because the gathering of the church together is a sign to the principle principalities and powers, not that this is a sinless people, but that this is a people who can no longer bear accusation because of the reign of Jesus through his crucifixion and through his resurrection from the dead. When that woman in your congregation sits in that seat and cries as she hears that music playing and she hears the words of those hymns because she knows that she has had that abortion. What we say to her is not, it's okay. What we say to her is not, those who practice bloodshed will in fact inherit the kingdom of God. We say, no, 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 no. Learn, if you're in Christ Jesus, to sing with us back to the devil. You are exactly right in every accusation that you bring against me. You are accusing the brothers and sisters and they overcome you, not because you're wrong, but through Revelation chapter 12, the blood of Christ and the power of their testimony. We stand and say, you're right about us, but we've been accused, we've been indicted, we've been arrested, we've been dressed up in purple and beaten, we've been stapled to a Roman cross, we've had all the wrath of God poured out upon us, we were pulled down off of that and left as a bloated, abandoned, cursed corpse. Can't re-execute me. And on a Sunday morning, 
in Jerusalem. Eyelids that were scabbed over in blood opened up. And a piece of dead, cold heart tissue started to beat again. And cold, lifeless hands began to twitch and to move and to reach up and to pull off a face cloth and walk out into the sun where by the power of the resurrecting Spirit of God, God announced exactly what He thinks of Jesus of Nazareth and everyone whose life is hidden in Him. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We don't come together as those who are former sinners. We don't come together as those who are regular people. We don't come together as those who have a difference in and of ourselves from the people out there in the world. We come together as the crucified. And when we join in worship, we are joining with an already existing worship service in the heavenly places. We're just a satellite campus. <laughs> and you may say, I love to come to a conference because I hear all of these voices singing and it's so different from my little tiny struggling church plant out there in that storefront building. It's so different from my little tiny dying rural church out there where everybody is moved away from. I hear all of these voices, I can hear the arena, and that can be a, a kind of encouragement to us from time to time. But what we need to remember is that every single Lord's Day, when we gather together, we are joining by the eyes of faith with a number that no man can number. A church that is awesome as an army with banners. We are part of a huge, global, transgenerational movement, the old, restful, and resurrected. And we stand there with them confessing, we were lost, but you were slain. And with your blood, you have purchased a church. That has the power to transform. That has the power to recalibrate. That has the power to correct and to rebuke. Because that is the voice of Christ. And it gives us a way out of our self-sufficiency. If Jesus is able to build this church and the gates of hell cannot stop it, then Jesus is going to build his church. We sit around and wonder, where's the next John Piper? Where's the next Billy Graham? Where's the next Charles Spurgeon? Do our, our Sunday schools functioning well enough to produce the next John Piper and the next Billy Graham, the next Charles Spurgeon? I hope so. But the next John Piper might be drunk right now. <laughs> the next Billy Graham might be selling marijuana a few blocks from here right now. The next Charles Spurgeon might be a male prostitute right now. No one says that God is going to raise up from within our established ranks. What he says is, I will bring out of the world and out of sinful humanity in every single generation a church. And I will build it, not necessarily with the people you expect, I will build it with ex-fishermen and ex-tax collectors and ex-terrorists and ex-fornicators and ex-adulterers and ex-murderers, and I will testify through that your power is not enough. I will build my church. When we gather together, that 
is what we say to one another. We announce in our little places, in our little congregational meetings, in our little acts of discipline, our little confrontations, and our little words of encouragement as we gather around the table, as we watch that new believer being baptized, we are seeing the kingdom of God uprooting another kingdom. And we are seeing that Jesus was right when he says, I'm going to build this church over a reptile's skull. The kingdom of God will come. And it's not a matter of talk. It's not a matter of just eating and drinking. It's not a matter of just evangelizing and congregating. It's not just a matter of deciding decisions and resolving conflicts. It's not just a matter of singing songs and choosing hymns. The kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I pray for those in this room who are lonely. I pray for those in this room who feel isolated, I pray, I pray for those in this room who feel cut off and far and distant from you. And I pray, Father, that we would seek you out and we would find you not in our loneliness and not in our individualism and not in our isolatedness, but, Father, we would come together with our brothers and sisters in your household, in your body, in your colony of the kingdom, and we would see you at work as you speak to us through your word, as you feed us bread and wine, as you order us and gift us and discipline us. Would you prepare us to rule and reign as servant kings and servant queens in a new creation? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.